So our second presenter is Cheryl Perkins. A little bit about Cheryl. She's a townie. <laughs> By adoption. <laughs> Cheryl Perkins is a longtime resident of St. John's, member of St. John's uh, St. Thomas's Church, a graduate of Memorial University, and retired from office work in the Faculty of Medicine. She decided in 2015 that it might be interesting to do a bit of Bible study and signed up for an introduction to the Psalms here at Queens College. And as we always say, it's like laced potato chips. You can't just have one. <laughs> so once you get a taste for it, that, that's it. You're stuck with us. Then she took another course and another and so on and so on. Eventually, she realized that it might be possible to get a degree from all those courses. <laughs> and started branching out into other subjects like theology to fill the gaps in her knowledge. <laughs> history has always been an interest of hers, uh, family history, Newfoundland history, church history, and more. And her paper on, on Archdeacon Wicks for uh, Church History of Newfoundland and Labrador sparked her interest in him. And in Newfoundland during her stay here, leading to her writing a thesis on him. So welcome, Cheryl Perkins. Okay, good, good morning, everybody. As we just announced, my presentation is on Archdeacon Edward Wicks. And the first question I usually get when I talk about my research was who was Archdeacon <laughs> Edward Wicks? Because <laughs> he's nowadays a little bit obscure. Uh, next slide. Uh, if you go to St. Thomas's Church down in the basement near the chapel, you'll see a photograph of St. Thomas, <laughs> Thomas Wicks, uh, or of, that, of Edward Wicks, and he's listed as the first incumbent of St. Thomas Church. So that's a really, that's okay, that's a really short version. A slightly longer version of him oh, is that he was a Church of England missionary. He was employed by the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, which I will refer to as the SPG. In two different colonies, actually. He went to Nova Scotia first and then to Newfoundland. And the SPG was a voluntary group founded in 1701. It had two aims. One, to provide administrations of the church for British people overseas. And the other, to evangelize the non-Christian races subject to the crown, as they said back then. <laughs> and his interest was mainly number one, to take care of the British people overseas. Now, I'm going to give a little background on Newfoundland back in the day. And the population is where I'm going to start. Newfoundland, as many people here, everyone here probably knows, had a very unusual colonial history, and the settlement pattern was very, very slow. By 1750, there were only 6,700 people in the whole island, or settlers I'm talking about here. And... Uh, most, that's actually an exaggeration because most of these people would have been servants and they would have come over temporarily and gone back after their contracts were over. By 1854, the population had risen dramatically to 75,000 approximately, and it kept on rising. There was um, also a difference in the population. The earlier settlers were almost exclusively English Protestants, and most of them would have been Church of England. The new immigrants, <laughs> the new immigrants were largely Irish Roman Catholics, and that had deep implications for the situation in Newfoundland and with the Church of England. Uh, Newfoundland didn't become an official crown colony until quite late, 1824. So there were a lot of political changes taking place right at the time Wicks was here. Its first civil governor was appointed at that time. Sir Thomas Cochrane, and he and Wicks were close associates. Uh, Catholic, the reformers weren't satisfied, of course. They wanted a representative government. So there was still a lot of lobbying and fighting and debating about getting representative government. And representative government alone didn't help the Catholics because they were still suffering under a lot of restrictions, legal restrictions. Mm -hmm. And it didn't help that the British government passed uh, the Catholic Emancipation Act. The Newfoundland Catholics thought it, thought it applied to them, but due to the legal technicality, it didn't. <laughs> so they didn't, in fact, get their own emancipation until Newfoundland also got the representative government in 1832. And that was, again, all this political turmoil was going on when Wicks was here. 
And I'm going to summer, I'm going to jump back a bit to Thomas Gray. Thomas Gray never actually set foot, you know, the founder of the SVG. He never actually set foot in Newfoundland. He sailed past it on his way to the Americas. He talked to a sea captain who happened to have been here, but he was able to form a firm opinion on the religious situation in Newfoundland. <laughs> and yet here we are. He, he can't believe that such a nation in the UK could taste a little pair of such a colony. There never, there ne neither was nor is any preaching or prayers or sacraments or any ministerial and divine offices. They, you know, us colonists, should be suffered, should be allowed to live as those who know no God in the world. <laughs> and this was long before Wicks arrived, but this view of the Newfoundland settler population as people who had no God in the world was remarkably uh, persistent. <laughs> now, he was partly right. There were very few clergymen in Newfoundland in the 1700s, and the numbers increased very slowly. Uh, the first one in the Church of England that we know of for sure, if you don't count the occasional uh, chaplains and, you know, Dable chaplain, a person like that, was John Jackson in Newfoundland, uh, sorry, St. John's. Uh, he was a, a chaplain as well, but he was also assigned to minister to the local population. He died in 1717, so that was a while ago. <laughs> More importantly, there were no bishops. Now, the Church of England, of course, being an Episcopal church, you need bishops. The bishops have to... <laughs> 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 so, we undoubtedly believe in the bishops. He's a very strong believer in this concept. <laughs> you, you guys, be careful. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you didn't have a bishop, you couldn't have any priests ordained locally. You had to, you had a like, likely candidate, you had to send them back to England, or you had to persuade them to come from England to Newfoundland in the first place. Uh, and also, the local colonial church seemed to feel the need, especially during Wix's time, seemed to feel the need for a bishop as local leadership. They were beginning to feel very much under threat, and uh, they wanted someone with authority to speak up for them. Now, in spite of all this conviction that, you know, the Flanders were living as though they didn't know God, there was, in fact, a lot of religion going on in Newfoundland, or religious practices. Uh, there were many, many people, men and women, many of them without education, most of them without the authorization of the church, <laughs> but they read the Bible, they read the prayer, prayer book, which was extremely important. Most of their neighbors might not be able to read, they read to them. <clears throat> they prayed together. They baptized babies, they married people, they buried people. So this was going on, and the, Wix was actually kind of, kind of positive of this. He was always very concerned that they might fall into error because they didn't have the proper guidance. But he did say very, a lot of positive things about people who, in spite of all the barriers to lack of education, did contain, continued to practice their religion. Now, I'm going to give a bit of a background on Wix, and no, I didn't get his name wrong up there. <coughs> I'm not talking first about his father, Samuel Wix, because there's a lot of parallels between their views on religion. Now, the Wixes were originally a rural family, but a, gener a couple generations before Samuel, they arrived in London and started working in the building trades. They did extremely well in the building trades in London. By the time Samuel Wix was born, or old enough to go to be educated, the family had enough money that unlike most, some of his cousins and all of his ancestors, he was not apprenticed as a bricklayer or tiler or plumber, or whatever. He was educated properly. He went to Charterhouse in Cambridge. He started out trying for law and he eventually became a clergyman. He was actually a very prominent clergyman. And uh, to quote uh, Manning Knuckles, who was really good on this period, he was described as a pre-Tractarian high churchman with a then unusually ironic view of Roman Catholicism. Now, that doesn't mean he approved 100% of Roman Catholics. I mean, we are talking about <laughs> this period in history. What it seems to have meant was that he, he generally thought the Roman Catholic Church was an apostolic church, like the Church of England. They had a lot in common, although the Roman Catholics were in error on some points, you know, like the position of the Pope and things like that. And perhaps eventually the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of England could even reconcile. 
This does not mean he approved of Catholic emancipation. <laughs> like his son, Edward, he was opposed to Catholic participation in the political process. And just, I'm sure everybody here knows this, but just to go quickly, a pre-Tractarian high, high churchman is not the same as a Tractarian high churchman. Mm -hmm. This gets horribly complicated but very quickly. A pre-Tractarian high churchman, you know the next one now, uh, he, he's, his, he, he follows the next one. Our apostolic succession, supremacy of scripture, sacramental grace and Eucharist and baptism, and a very practical approach to spirituality. No, no enthusiasm. I mean, <laughs> no emotional conversion experiences, nothing like that. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they all they just have a very practical thing. approach to aiding the poor and that sort of thing as well. And Let's not forget this last one, the duty of the state to protect and promote the church, vice versa. Uh, you could almost see Wicks at the beginning of his career in every single one of these. He was clearly following in the footsteps steps of his father when it came to his uh, theological views. Now, the next slide, please. Some other characteristics of Samuel Wicks. This word, which I can almost never pronounce, indefatigable. It's a general <laughs> word for really in hard-working clerical types. Samuel was called that, so was Wicks. And they all had long, long lists of their, both had long lists of their activities. You'll notice an early interest in Samuel in, in mission work. Not mission work to the British, mind you, but still he was interested in mission work. He was also devoted to the Church of England, naturally, and to the temporal interests of its fellow creatures. So he had an interest in helping out other people. And the next one, I just put this in because I think it's a word we really should reintroduce. He was a controversialist. He liked debating uh, controversial subjects in public, such as Roman Catholics and the death penalty and so on. He had many posts, including the rector of Inworth in a village in Essex, and he was the hospitaller and vicar of St. Bartholomew of the Less in London, associated with St. Bartholomew's Hospital. At this time, it also included a few people living around the hospital. Now for Edward. Edward had very, was provided with very much uh, uh, an education that was very similar to his father's. He immediately went into the church. Uh, he's, he had a bit of experience working as a pastor at Inworth, which you will remember was his father's parish. And then he was ordained. He almost immediately got appointed by the SPG as a missionary to Nova Scotia. There is a secondary source uh, that indicates that the prominent Samuel Wicks may have been a friend of one John Inglis, who happened to be the Bishop of Nova Scotia. But I can't prove anything, there may be a connection there. And in Nova Scotia, he was only there for a couple of years, but he was immediately appointed as, the next one please, the bishop's chaplain, but this didn't stop him from engaging in a lot of pastoral activities, holding services, visiting the sick, all that kind of thing. He traveled with the bishop in 1826 to Nova, through Nova Scotia, and in 1827 he first arrived in Newfoundland. He did not spend very long here. He was immediate, almost immediately called back to Nova Scotia by some uh, emergency, which was not specified, which occurred in the fishing village of Liverpool, which he was assigned to. But anyway, he did manage to visit Torbay, along with the, the governor, the bishop, a couple other clergymen, to visit the, church, the school facilities there. Uh, back in Nova Scotia, he picked up typhus. He was visiting sick people. Irish immigrants that were the, the from one of those notorious migrant ships. And he went to England to recover. And while he was there, he finished his MA and married Fanny Brown. So next we have his transfer to Newfoundland. This is where things get really, really complicated. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try and leave out a lot better, simplify it a bit. <laughs> The complications were largely due to the fact that the bishop, Bishop Inglis, who had very firm ideas on who he should appoint to various posts that did not always coincide with what the people in the parish wanted, uh, 
did not, in fact, have complete control over the process. In three of the locations where he had archdeacons, not including Newfoundland, the archdeacon was also appointed as the rector of the biggest local parish, and the local governor had control over that appointment. And the two did not always see eye to eye. So you had an incredibly complicated negotiations going on. And I, I finally decided you can just call it, you know, musical chairs with archdeacons because it was <laughs> around and around. But if we go to the next, I think it's the next slide, the short version. In April 1828, the Archdeacon of New Brunswick, George Best, went on sick leave to London, and they probably knew he wasn't going to be back. He died not that long afterwards. So it became known that there was an opening. There was one of the big, big conflicts over the post of the rector in New Brunswick. They finally solved it. And Archdeacon Coster of Newfoundland, who found the climate not to his not good for his health, and who never also had family in New Brunswick, and who was also, by Inglis's view, a really good, solid, high church type person. In other words, someone he liked appointing, yeah. went to New Brunswick. So then you have two candidates for the position of Archdeacon of Newfoundland. Wicks didn't just walk into it, although it appears he had an interest in it from quite an early stage in the very lengthy proceedings that followed. Archdeacon Spencer, of course, had previously been in Newfoundland uh, until his health failed. That's a recurring theme. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he was eventually to return to Newfoundland as the first bishop. But it's not at all clear that he wanted to go to Newfoundland right then. Uh, one source said that he was reluctant because he, he wanted to stay working with the Black people of Bermuda. Another person, another source said that he refused outright. But Bishop, so but bishop Inglis... Uh, seemed pretty certain for quite a while that this was the candidate he wanted, although he was running into the same problems with the local governor. And that was where things more or less stood until Inglis and Wicks went back to visit Bermuda, and Inglis wrote just before he left, I'm going to Bermuda, I'm going to talk to everyone face to face, and I'm going to get this thing settled. More or less, I'm paraphrasing. Now, Wicks wasn't idle during this. He clearly wanted to go to Newfoundland. Whether from ambition or not, um, uh, he he expressed a great interest. If he could use his skills there, but the first instance incident here is rather strange. In July, next one, in July of 1829, Wicks, in his position as uh, as chaplain, wrote a letter that had to be written right away to go to England on behalf of Bishop Inglis, who was ill with the flu or something. So he went through a few administrative points. Then he came to one point, which he even Wicks admits. This one is a little, you know, it's difficult to point out. But the bishop asked me to tell you who he really wants for this job in Newfoundland, and it's me. Now, he does think there might be some objections to this, and he explains, no, I'm honestly, you know, I'm really, I'm just expressing the bishop, bishop's views on this matter. And by the way, if you think I'm too young, you can consult with the Bishop of London and the Archbishop of Canterbury, and I'm sure they'll, they'll answer to that. Again, I think I see the hint of influence, or the hint to use influence here. That doesn't seem to have immediately have the desired effect. And December the 1st, Wicks wrote one of these letters. It's kind of a standard expression of letter you find a lot. You know, some missionary hears about an opening and he writes to whoever is in charge, expressing in the most modest terms possible that he thinks he might be a suitable candidate. And this is the type of letter that Wicks wrote to England, who, of course, he worked with quite closely. This time he mentions that Governor Cochrane and Archdeacon Coster are strong supporters of his candidates. <laughs> and still nothing. <laughs> Between April the 20th and May 30th, Inglis and Wicks went to, went to uh, Bermuda. Um, this is the trip at Wings, that Wings, Inglis said before he left that, you know, we're going to settle this. When they came back, Wicks was archdeacon. So whatever happened in Bermuda was obviously crucial. And in fact, they only arrived in Halifax on May 30th. And June 18th, Wicks and his family were in St. John's. Wow. That so was really, really fast. Now, what about his duties in Newfoundland? 
I'm not going to try and list everything he did. I mean, he went on committees. He organized. He he organized groups, you know, like uh, uh, or uh, to support the church. He organized groups to help deal with the alcohol problem. Suppose the temperance groups. <laughs> he he was he was constantly writing, you know, soliciting help for Newfoundland. But he held he held services. He held services in St. John's, Petty Harbor, Fort Bay, and Portugal Cove. That's when he wasn't traveling further afield. I'm going to stick to a few main points here. <clears throat> the first thing he was really important to him was collecting information. Now, this makes sense. I mean, the main job, you're assigned to a new territory. You need to find out what the needs are, what the people need, you know, how many people there are, how many of them are Protestant Episcopalians, you know, this sort of thing. So he did collect a certain amount of data. But he also wanted to personally see as much of the his territory of the colony as he could. And he traveled very extensively. In 1830, he went to the south and west coasts coast and got Governor, Governor Cochran on one of his trips. Uh, when I say the west coast, it means he went along, he went up as far as usually around the Bay of Islands, that Bay St. George, that far, not right away up north. <laughs> um, 1831, he went again with Cochran to Labrador this time. It's the only time he went to Labrador. He landed in the Venison Islands. And this is most infuriating, a very poorly documented. <laughs> I, you know, usually when these, usually when Wicks went anywhere, he wrote in considerable detail. He went to this cove, he baptized two people and he buried somebody, he went, and so on. But there's almost nothing on the trip to the Venison Islands. In 1835, Wicks went back to the Southwest Coast this time on his own. Uh, this uh, It was a very interesting trip. I think he possibly was inspired by Cormac. He, a lot of it was overland. He well, tried to cross from Placentia Bay overland to uh, the West Coast with the aid of the uh, Mi'kmaq guides. Uh, he didn't manage it. He had to turn back and go by boat. Uh, and in the end, his wife had to send a rescue ship for him. But anyway, <laughs> if you were wondering where he was, he, gone, he was gone so long. This is the one he documented in his book, The Six Months of a Newfoundland Missionary's Journal, from February to August 1835. I usually call it just six months. Yeah. Uh, now, what did he find? This is the interesting bit. And it's where things get controversial about what, how, what he reported on what he found. For example... <laughs> O'Flaherty called him an ecclesiastical snoop and prig who sniffed intoxication and licentiousness in almost every community he visited and frequently drew attention to his own zeal. And it's, well, we'll discuss that in a few minutes. And he, he did write about, a lot about wrongdoing, let's face it. I mean, you know, uh, but he also wrote some positive things about the Newfoundlanders. Uh, but he, and even though Flaherty admitted, the dark side was there to be seen. The monotony and harshness of a fishing way of life. <clears throat> and the, you know, it was, was created victims as well as heroes. So the question remains, were Wix's observations accurate? There's no way of verifying them. I mean, he wrote them. That's it. But Calvin Hollett compared the faults reported by Methodist missionaries with those reported by Wix. And generally, the Methodists were a bit more restrained. Yeah. Now, they had some things in common. They, no, none of the missionaries liked drunkenness. And also, you know, offenses related to drunkenness. People have, uh, uh, later writers have sometimes um, that well, maybe there wasn't quite as much. Maybe they only got drunk like at weddings or when a you know new ship arrived in the harbor or something, which is certainly possible. But there's a wide there's a wide reports of drunkenness. The other, I suppose, you could talk about general rel religious practices. They weren't keeping the Sabbath properly. If there were services offered, they didn't go to them. This sort of thing. Now, Wix's reports spanned. A wide variety, a wider range of topics, including ones that he considered too shocking to put in his book. <laughs> uh, say cursing. Now, if it was blasphemy, you could see why he'd be really upset. He just said cursing, it could you know, bad language, especially from women, and pipe smoking. I think here he's probably doing what many people have done over the years and confusing social norms with moral norms, social class norms. But he did not like women smoking pipes. 
fatal child neglect. He had two stories of one was of a drunk, drunken woman overlaying an infant, and one was of a, a woman who left her infant on a beach and got drunk and forgot about it and drowned. Superstition, what he called prophesizing, I guess, you know, telling, you know, telling fortunes, and also doing little superstitious rituals to protect yourself, like that. And two big ones, adultery and incest, sometimes both at the same time. Now, it's hard, you, you, like I said, you can't say for sure how reliable they were. Some certainly read as though they were secondhand reports. He gets into the harbor and someone says, you know, that lot over there, you know, yeah. this is what happened over there. So I think perhaps they were over dramatic. Perhaps they were, in fact, based on nothing. Some of them were based on nothing other than gossip. However, it's they're not entirely unrealistic either. These things happen then and they happen now. However, the gathering of the information was kind of a means to the end. He, he wanted now that he knew what he felt he knew what was needed in Newfoundland. He decided to provide. He had to provide as much as he could of that. And one of his big with his big aims was to improve the opportunities for Church of England worship. There were very, it had to be Church of England worship. <laughs> you know, it, the other types didn't sort of count, I guess. And uh, so in the smaller settlements, he wrote a lot about those. There's a continuing effort to provide buildings for worship, buildings for clergy to live in, clergy to actually go to these places. So this, this continued throughout his time. But there was also seen to be a need in St. John's for a new place of worship. And in fact, Wicks was not the first to identify this. Governor Cochran had also thought that the Church of England building was far too small for the number of Church of England people there. And Wicks took up this project with considerable enthusiasm. The main reason, and he had facts and figures backing this up, was that there were too few pews, not enough seats in the church. At this time, they rented out some of them to the earn money, for, you know, raise money for the church. But there were, and they, and they said, well, they could, ra they could, they could raise more money if they could rent out more pews, but they couldn't rent out more pews without renting out the ones for the free, the free ones for the poor people. Hmm. Uh, Wicks took some short-term actions to try and deal with this when he first arrived, instead of assisting the uh, rector in the two existing church services in St. John's. He started a third service, as well as you know, going around to the smaller towns. He also uh, uh, wrote that if somebody who has rented a pew doesn't show up for a service, anyone can sit in it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how well that went down, but anyway, that's what he said. Another uh, One of the main barriers was land. This was actually an easy one to solve because he had the support of Governor Cochran. So Governor Cochran was easily able to provide him, or rather provide the Church of England, with a piece of land that wasn't too far from the existing garrisons, and on, on very reasonable conditions, really. The condition was mainly that they allow Church of England members from the garrison to worship there. <clears throat> but the next thing, the money. This was a real problem. Support for colonial churches was declining. There was an increased view in... The, in Britain, that the colonial colonials should, you know, run their own churches. They should finance their own churches and stop depending on money from the UK. Uh, nevertheless, the Wicks appealed to S the SDG many times for money. And he raised money through the publication of his book. He needed two thousand pounds for a 62 by 36 foot building with galleries that would hold 700 people <laughs> and half of the seats would be free and the other half would be cheap. <laughs> so this is this was a big preoccupation of his. There was some local controversy in letters, anonymous letters to the paper saying, you know, it's a waste of money, we don't need another church. And one from one assumed Presbyterian saying the Presbyterians <laughs> needed the church more than the Church of England crowd did. <laughs> So that was one of his, those are some of his main preoccupations. But he also had to, he was involved with clerical discipline. So I'm going to give two examples here. The one was the Reverend Otto Weeks in 1830. He was a deacon, an assistant, a, a, minister, a missionary in Trinity Bay. And this was immediately after Wicks had arrived in, in, in Newfoundland. So he wasn't a really, you know, experienced person at this point. Uh, there's also a very experienced missionary named Reverend Bullock in Trinity Bay. 
And Reverend Bullock had contacted Wicks, as he should, pointing out that this deacon was not up to par, he, he was misbehaving. So Wicks goes off by packet and put to Trinity Bay, thinking, well, I thought Reverend, Reverend Bullock was, he was exaggerating, he had to be, but then he only didn't tell me the half of it. He was so restrained. <laughs> so I, do, I can't, you know, it was a long letter. But let's say the deacon was lying. He lied about his income. He lied about whether he was permitted to perform Holy Communion, which he wasn't, but he did anyway. He lied about whether he was going to show up and perform the services he was allowed to show up, never showed up. But the big one was the money. There's a lot of money sort of went missing. Uh, part of it was through bills that they circulated. Someone would have a bill promising to pay so much money and it would sort of circulate through the community until it came back to the original person and he or she would, you know, would uh, pay for it. Sometimes some of these that went through the deacon's hands were rejected by the person who had originally issued them as being false. One of the people involved was the previous archdeacon. Mm -hmm. He had money that... Um, he held money for left by a deceased local person for the maintenance of his child and the child's mother. He paid out the interest a couple of years, and that money sort of wasn't there. A lot of he quarreled with everybody. Apparently, <laughs> he quarreled with his fellow uh, ministers, the fellow ministers of the church. He quarreled with local people, including a respectable woman who was an invalid, invalid with a child in arms. He counsel one one of the local laymen was only persuaded to stop to avoid you know to to not prosecute him for defamation for the good name of the church. <laughs> he said uh, he said he'd be American uh, become an American Baptist if there was any Episcopal interference with his actions. <laughs> so not surprisingly, Wicks decided that he had failed his probationary period. <laughs> he should not be rehired. <laughs> but he turned to Bishop Inglis for help. He didn't know what to do. This is the only example I remember of Wicks being uncertain. Wicks was not an uncertain person generally. The local people expected the deacon's employer, that is the church and the SPG, to come up with the two or three hundred pounds that were missing. And that was a lot of money. Wicks himself got 300 pounds a year from the SPG. The deacon claimed he earned 200, he only got 100, and most people got a lot less. Now, I was unable to find Wink English's reply, but uh, the following year, uh, the deacon was no longer listed as a missionary in the Diocese of Nova Scotia. Now, the sermon, he, this is a typical sermon, he covered a lot of different topics, but he also covered accusations or suggestions that missionaries might engage in wrongdoing. <laughs> so he pointed, he said, first of all, it's unlikely because the, missionary, the missionaries are very carefully chosen. With yeah, There's not a problem. They, they, there's no worldly considerations involved, which you've got to wonder what, you know. I think they probably was. But <laughs> in any case, that was, a, that was it. Uh, but if they're found to be wrongdoing, that's no problem. SPGA puts them away. But what if uh, the missionary gets away with his misbehavior for a while? Well, that's the fault of the congregation. <gasps> because the congregation should not gossip. They should not engage in secret <laughs> whispers and rumors. They should have open disclosure. Now, I will remind you that in the case of de the deacon, uh, he was persuaded not to take the deacon to court to preserve the good name of the church. Yeah. But this may have been a, it sounds good. I mean, you can't argue with it, really. But I don't think it was what always happened. And we'll see more about that later. And the final, the final one I'm going to mention here is the vote fundraising. And local fundraising was a bit limited. In good years, yeah, there was money. In bad years, there was none. Poor people would often give in kind, you know, fish or lumber or their efforts. So there, people did try to support their local church, but it never seemed to be enough, especially for something as big as a building in, you know, the new church in St. John's. 
uh, women in the women of St. John's Church held bazaars like fall fairs, early version of fall fairs. <laughs> Mrs. Mix was involved in that. And they raised money for, they were going to raise it for a new organ, but they had a fire in Harbor Grace, so they donated it to that cause instead. And then they raised money for the new church. So a lot of the money, a lot of the fundraising. The oldest stone building in the in church of Cat Newton Land. Yes, they were determined to build it in stone, weren't they? Because yes. uh, they kept their... Uh, they were the third down. church yeah. on the... Yeah. I just came from Harbor Grace, yeah. so I know a lot about Harbor Grace. <laughs> Okay, uh, okay, then England is the main source of of his uh, went where, where, where they went for money when they couldn't get it in the land. And of course, his best raising fund, fundraiser was the book Six Months, and uh, it went through two editions, and excerpts were also published in the magazines. So uh, it got a considerable circulation. So, what kind of things did Wicks use when he was appealing for money in England? Well, we mentioned that he he had talked about stories of poverty, neglect, degeneracy, which I already mentioned, and stories of admirable if disadvantaged people. And this is where we get back to the practice of religion by people who were not, who had no access to the clergy. There are many, many, many examples. I'm going to mention one of the Strickland family. They were a family of two brothers, their wives and their children. They lived in a couple of different places off the south coast of Newfoundland, and they were met twice. So we've got two different records of uh, what they were like and what their life was like. The first meeting was with Governor Cochran. And Governor Cochran points at, and describes it in some detail. And he points out that the uh, originally the only member of the family who could read was one of the wives. But she could only read print. But with great Simplicity, they added that they were ignorant how the church service should properly be performed, never having even seen a minister, but that the woman before mentioned had some little knowledge of it and performed it to the best of her abilities. So she was not only leading religious services, she also taught the rest of her family how to read. And by the time Wicks met the same family, it turns out that uh, he was talking to one of the brothers and he was able to read by then. And he said, we never saw a church, said he, or were where a church was, or got any schooling for reading is hard to be gotten in these places. But we taught ourselves, and we go through the prayers alternate, he and his brother, he meant, morning and evening, each Sunday. Wicks often used unexpected people as examples of moral behavior, like the Stricklands. You know, they're in rough situations, and look how admirably they're handling it. He talked of the pious Roman Catholic Placentia widower whose care for his children could well be imitated by careless Protestants, as he called it. <laughs> he also <laughs> mentioned the Roman Catholic Mi'kmaq, who were so regular in their devotions and kept Lent so well. He liked setting up examples like that. Now, now in the book, in the appendix to Wix's book, he includes a letter from one H.P. Thomas, who was a merchant of St. John's, who eventually became, I think, in a run involved in the committee that ran through the, the St. Thomas's church. Now, it's, a, it's anonymous in the book, but he also sent the same letter to the SPG with the name attached. That's how I know it was Mr. H.P. Thomas. And most of his um, appeal was based on the usual, you know, we, we need more space and so on, and these people are deprived, et cetera. But he also, uh, and he also, there's also a certain amount of guilt, inducing guilt. I'm paraphrasing again to save time. <laughs> he pointed out that because of the colonies, the aristocrats are relieved by, from their excess population. Because of the colonies, the merchants and the manufacturers have wealth from them using their raw materials. And even the poor in England at least have a church to worship in. <laughs> so the English are supposed to feel very guilty and send lots of money to them. <laughs> He also had, I have to admit, other motivations. Uh, he was extremely envious of a Bishop Fleming, who was a Roman Catholic bishop, who had just had a very successful fundraising tour in Ireland. And he was upset by the possibility that the new Roman Catholic chapel, he called it, might be the finest building in the, in the colony. So you do have the strictly you know, practical, we need more seats. You have the emotional appeals, and you have the... And we, oh, you know, we can't let those Catholics and those <laughs> non-dissenters you know, get the best of us. <laughs> Different tactics. 
Now, his relationships with other Christians, which sounds a little broader than it really is, because I'm only going to talk about two groups. The first one is the Roman Catholics. Now, the assumption at this period is if you're a Protestant, you're anti-Roman anti -Roman Catholic. Uh, that's an oversimplification. I don't think Wix was really anti all Roman Catholics. Uh, he had many not positive comments about Roman Catholic lay people. He did business with Roman Catholics. He and a Roman Catholic priest and layman from both congregations worked on improving the road to Torbay, inspired by Oberlin, of all people, a Protestant from France who was associated with the Christian Socialist movement. <laughs> but there was one group of Roman Catholics he really opposed extremely strongly. And that was Bishop Fleming and his closest supporters, whom he described as frankly seditious <laughs> and political <laughs> partisans. Now, Wicks obviously did not think his own firm support of an alliance between his church and the state was political partisanship. I think he had a bit of a, a, bit of a blind spot in that respect. And the second group is dissenters. Yes. Now, if <laughs> and if Wicks was perhaps more kindly inclined to Roman Catholics than was generally thought, there's no doubt he was deeply and completely opposed to dissent. He fought against dissenters at every opportunity. And remember when he in his first trip yes. to Newfoundland, he visited Torbay. He met one John Curtis. John Curtis was a Methodist school teacher. And he was a Church of England lay reader. And Coster had thought, well, he's a dissenter, but he's not that bad, you know, good enough. He, he conforms well enough, I think was the phrase. Um, Wicks did not take this point of view. <laughs> he almost immediately got involved in a big fight with John Curtis. It started with a dispute over whether the metrical Psalms or Wesley's hymns were better suited for church services. And it kept on going until the leaders of the Methodist Connection were brought into it. And Wicks finally decided that he could not possibly share the building in Torbay with Methodists any longer. And he needed to find a proper separate place for the Church of England worship. Uh, this real extreme, rather extreme hostility towards the centers and Wicks's tendency to react very strongly to anyone questioning his authority, even if it was over something like, I think the metrical psalm should be used as part of service. Marks his entire career. It comes up again and again. And I would speculate that he saw the dissenters as more of a threat than the Roman Catholics. Because the dissenters were, a lot of them, were inside the Church of England. And he had one very specific view of what the Church of England was. It did not include dissenters. And they said, but the dissenters were there and they might lead people like you know, Wix's flock astray. Whereas the Roman Catholics, you knew where you were with the Roman Catholics. They were in your church, you know, singing Wesley's hymns. <laughs> <laughs> now, to, I'm gonna try and summarize this to keep a lot of the time here. <laughs> His personality. Uh, I think there's no question he was a very devout man. I think he was a very honest man in his religion. He really believed all this. Uh, it, what he was doing was right. Um, and he he wasn't a time server. I don't think he wasn't someone who, well, don't, if it's a thing to do, I'll join the church and for, as a profession. I think he was an honest, devout believer. And he was definitely a very zealous man. He was possibly too zealous. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not just saying this. I mean, even Archdeacon uh, uh, Bishop Inglis, who generally supported whatever Wicks did, even he wrote a letter saying, basically, you know, sometimes I believe, you know, he gets a bit carried away. With and and I, I know how, I won't have time to get into his post, very brief post Newfoundland career, but the bishop he worked under then, Bishop Blomfield, who strikes me as the most patient <laughs> and an actual soul, he repeatedly said things to Wicks that indicated that Bishop Blomfield thought that. Wix's zeal, especially with regard to dissenters, was excessive. <laughs> Next, strong-minded, arrogant, possibly even authoritarian. I think there's no question. I think it was partly his personality. It was partly the structure within which he worked. It was part, you know, it, he worked, he was sat comfortable with a very hierarchical approach to church. Mm -hmm. uh, 
he considered it his sacred duty to fulfill his position as archdeacon, which meant purifying the Church of England, making sure all those dissenters either fall you know, converted or got out. <laughs> but but yeah, it was he was not an easygoing man. I think Bishop Blomfield, what was he? He suggested a more conciliatory approach to dissenters, um, which was not a very conciliatory man. <laughs> I don't think that was probably one of his worst failings. I think he was very intelligent. I mean, he was not only well educated, he was interested in the world around him, the natural history here in Newfoundland, things like that. Um, I, he's a common one that comes up all the time as hypocrite. I don't think he was much more of a hypocrite than the rest of us. I think <laughs> a lot of that is based on a misunderstanding of his views of Roman Catholics and the fact that the ones. He is sometimes was positive about them, sometimes negative, but those were different groups of Roman Catholics. He wasn't someone who lumped them all together, unlike dissenters. Even. Yeah. <laughs> and his achievements, just about everybody who, whether they liked him or not, they admit that he was a very hard worker. Very, very hard worker. Uh, he was, he, he was, gets the credit for having a bishop in Newfoundland, although he didn't arrive until after Wicks left, and the credit for building St. Thomas's Church. Now, the end of Wix's career in Newfoundland. On October 11th, next, next one, he wrote a resignation letter. His health is very poor. He doesn't think six months sick leave will do. He needs to educate his son. He wants his pension. And by the way, he's, you know, he's already informed St. Thomas church wardens about their the conditions, about the donation they received. 19th, they left. Now, they don't appear to have told very many people they were leaving. The sudden disappearance of Archdeacon Wicks and his family caused an incredible amount of disarray and consternation in the Anglican Church in St. John's and Newfoundland more generally as word got out. It wasn't, um, now, on October 23rd, you know, and Wicks has already been gone like 12 days, a Governor Prescott notifies the Colonial Office. Uh, the actual letter I couldn't find, but the summary was reports the second and mysterious disappearance of Mr. Wicks. There are reports in circulation injurious to Mr. Wicks's moral character. Oh. Now, 1826, uh, sorry, 18, October 8, 26, 1832, I should slow down. We finally get a letter from a clergyman, Reverend Bridge. He was not actually at this point a missionary, but he was the curate, temporarily the curate of St. John's. And he writes, or both authorities, debt is the reason, £1,300. Uh, there's a meeting of his creditors. Most of this was due on the new church. And at the end, he writes, he was detected by five or six persons, some of them Protestants and others Roman Catholics, on the night of Saturday, the 6th, uh, in company with a common prostitute. Oh, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second thing as non common <laughs> Okay, and November 1st, we have a meeting of all the missionaries that could get together, plus Reverend Brick, who was not technically a missionary, and including Reverend Carrington, who was the rector of St. John's and probably the senior person left after Weeks' departure. And they couldn't come to a conclusion as to what they could do. Three of them wanted to hold an investigation. The other two seems to have had some doubts about that, possibly because their authority to hold an investigation on an archdeacon who wasn't even in the colony anymore was sort of not clear. So the first three wrote another letter, basically the same as the first one, except now the prostitute takes first place and the debt stays <laughs> back. <laughs> and finally, Bishop English responds to the news. He's over in England, my family trip with an SPG conference, so it takes him a while. The first letter, he wrote two different letters. They're both to officials at the SPG. I cannot but apprehend that something is wrong, but so sad is the state of society in Newfoundland at present oh. that no public man there can continue his reputation safe for an hour. Oh. And he's apparently planning to come to Newfoundland or to to Newfoundland. And the second one, I fear, fear Archdeacon Wicks is most inconveniently involved in the expenses of the new church at St. John's but for the present, I must wholly believe, disbelieve the other report. I have now communicated to him all that has reached me and shall be anxious for his answer. And of course, I was unable to find his letter to Wicks or Wicks's answer, assuming Wicks wrote one. 
And in the January of 1839, the SPG committee met, accepted with this resignation. They didn't give him a sanction. No comment made in the minutes. Oh. And that is the end of Wix's time in Newfoundland. Any I went a little bit over. I'm sorry, but are there any quick questions? So when did he die? Like back in England? No, he died in 18, 1866. He was about 64, 65 when he died. And what did he do when he got back? Uh, he recovered his health for about five years. Or okay. anyway, he did something that wasn't in public record for about five years. He had two short terms in uh, London parishes for in poor areas. So he was quite he was quite honest when he said in his letter. I don't think I mentioned it that he was willing if his health recovered, he was willing to take on even a even a low ranking post in the church. But the no church no post in the church, however low rank ranking is, you know, something you look down or something that that effect. The second one seems to have gone smoothly. During his second posting, each one lasted about two or three years. At least in the second posting, he didn't have letters of complaint going to the bishop. During the first posting, he was in, there were several letters, and they all followed the same pattern to Bishop Bonfield. Bishop Bonfield would write to Reverend Wicks. He said, yes, um, I've heard the complaint from the church wardens about you know, the psalms of scheduling a funeral, whatever it happened to be. And, it, and Wicks was not a stupid man, you know. He was like, yes, you are actually, I told him you were actually correct. And then he would write a paragraph of very patient and tactful advice about being conciliating, especially to, you know, dissenters, because it works a lot better if you do in that way. Uh, <laughs> and after that, uh, he apparently became ill again. Uh, they lived for a while in Jersey, where the three of them, him and his wife and his son, but especially his wife, were involved in a fascinating rabbit hole of a controversy where a woman was accusing them of misleading their, her daughter from Protestant, good Protestant religion because her daughter wanted to enter one of the early Church of England convents. And after that, he spent most many years apparently traveling the Mediterranean for his health. Yeah. I, I'm, I've heard that so <laughs> I have read the claims that he wrote and published during that period, and I think he probably yeah, was a reliable secondary source, but I have been unable to track down any of them. The like one, and the, the, in the late 60s, his, his son did become a priest, his son became a strong ritualist. I strongly suspect by this time that Wick and Wicks and his wife were Anglo Catholics anyway. And he spent the last year or two of his life, and he and his wife with his son in his son's house. And he died there of lung infection. And he had uh, he had had um, kind of a critic complaint for about 20, 26 years. And I've forgotten the name of it. So it didn't, there's no proof that it actually went back to his time in Newfoundland, but it made me believe that he may have been, he may actually have been ill while he was in Newfoundland, possibly. Any questions for Cheryl, either from here in the room or online? This was fabulous. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think when you think about Wix, it's really off this time. Um, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, Judge John Reeves' History of the Land, which I think was published about 1829, 30. So basically, Reeves is sort of the legal equivalent of Wicks as clergy, and that it's a shame that good British people yeah. don't have the rule of law right. in the case of right. Judge Reeves, whereas Wicks is sort of saying the same thing in terms of the Church of England. It's all the imperial mechanisms of the state and the whole colonial enterprise. Yeah. So it's sort of, I think, sort of the Reeves and Wicks, I think it's interesting to read yeah. those uh, together. And I think in terms of like what Wicks wrote, I mean, some of the letters where he's promoting himself. So I think it's really important to look at what was being written back as fundraising letters. So remember the representation of the people and their activities, both they're depraved, yeah. Therefore, send money. Yeah. They are noble. Therefore, <laughs> send money. Yeah. So I think that you try to send money, right? <laughs> and, and so I think that's important thing about Wicks. Like 
to approach the writing of missionaries always with that kind of critical lens in terms of the motivations and why they're saying what they're saying. The other thing I wanted to say, like the language of prostitute yeah. at the time was very easily bandied around for any woman who was poor yeah. with no obvious means of income. Yeah. So I, the assumption that somehow there were sexual antics yeah. um, may not be the case, that it could have been just a woman yeah. who was possibly living alone or poor or didn't have indigency and yeah. prostitution. It was almost yeah. interchangeable, like, yeah. even if you look at court records. So in terms of thinking about Wicks and and the kind of rumors that circulated yeah. about him, it's important to think about the kind of, in a way, social misogyny that yeah. was informing things that were, yeah. were said. And uh, yeah, so, and I think it was also interesting how the women were leading the services in Cochrane's time. Cochrane reported that, but then Wicks is saying, oh no, the men are learning. So send more money because the men are taking over. <laughs> so send more money, right? And yeah. so this whole, uh, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, like for me, like Wicks is motivations, but very much a... Um, an arm of the Church yeah. of England, and he saw that role, I think, very seriously oh. about what he was doing. And um, yeah, so yeah. anyway, just like I said, for me, there are just things about uh, what he was saying about people, and and yeah, from a modern perspective, yeah. it's, it's sort of amusing. Yeah. Uh, but like with the historian's lens, it's kind of good to delve into those yeah. and kind of understand where they were coming from and the possible motivations. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I yeah. didn't actually make that connection. I just, I took a, I, with the Stricklands, I kind of said, oh, well, I guess Wicks just didn't happen to meet the lady at the house or something. But you've got a good point there. Yes. You're saying now the women are taking. Uh, or go here. For everybody who doesn't know who you are. Okay. Who you are. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, no, I'm a Bonnie Morgan. Um, I've done some work on the history of yeah. the Anglican Church in Church of England and Newfoundland. Yes. And you were the external. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. You know, she knew what she had written. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, you know what I, I'd written. And also, I, I doubted the prostitute story myself. I mean, mm -hmm. I could see Wicks associating with a poor woman in the streets, as you said, but that he got in, in a compromising position with five people who just happened to be a both theme. The all <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and all the conflicts that were going on, yeah. like that you in the actual you know, yeah. written work that you talked about, the kind of political conflict yeah. and everything else. So um, yeah, that we that contribute as well. The idea of writing to the SPG for more money yeah. is not unusual. I did some of my undergraduate work on Newfoundland mm -hmm. church history, yeah. and there are thousands of letters to the yeah. SPG. We were doing well here, but we need more money. Yeah. And then I later and like did some on my great grandfather was a missionary in Alberta oh, from the yeah. SPG. Yeah. Unfortunately, he did start one of the residential schools, which that's yeah. a bit of a shame to me, but he did it for all the right reasons. Yes, of course. And he was always ready, give us more money. Yeah. <laughs> and these insult things, he was accused of doing some things. Yeah. Yeah. And basically, because somebody wanted to take his position, wanted to get rid of him. It's yeah. a crazy. He was, took some of the cloth that was sent to the Indians. Mm -hmm. He said, damn it to his horse, <laughs> whose name was Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and he was accused of visiting a woman in her, her own house. Oh, dear. Shocking. An Indian woman. <laughs> yeah. And that's the way it was put. Now, yeah. knowing, knowing my grandmother, his, his, yeah. his daughter, I don't think... No. Anything happened, but then that's pretty to some my part. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a different world, uh, but I mean, it's relevant today too because, as he which said in his sermon, you can't gossip. It's, it's dangerous. You can't. Yes. You, you shouldn't be judging people on gossip. You should have proper investigation. Now he doesn't appear. Anyway, mm -hmm. Oliver, you saying something? This information is quite <laughs> relevant. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Alternate reality. Yes. <laughs> Alternate <laughs> facts. There you yes. go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, those uh, good presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, referring to the person of uh, Samuel Witch now. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm, yes, uh, I'm able to 
assess some critical personality of each. Mm -hmm. And um, among those is that uh, he engaged in the personal development. Um, he was committed to duties. He was dedicated to humanity and service, you know, oh, trying yes, to meet yeah, people's yeah. Uh, the needs of his people. Mm -hmm. yeah. He had passion for research, you know, yeah. oh, yes, gaining so. knowledge. Yeah. And um, he acknowledged human's imperfection, you know, mm -hmm. self-awareness. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he had courage to take on new challenges and apply changes where necessary. So my question is, uh, you know, we have to move forward. Right. Yeah. So, what do you think is the critical area of this personality that could be assessed contemporarily for today's clergy men and women in order to move the church of God forward? Uh, do you mean Samuel or uh, do you mean Edward? Edward, because Samuel's because Samuel's view of his his he he wanted to see the church united even to the extent. That the Roman Catholics and the Church in England were united. Samuel Wicks did. I think that's. Well, but yeah. only if they came to us. Well, okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but but he was interested. He he was interested in. Uh, you, we, you know, yes, okay. It, it was not completely open, but he was interested in reaching out to other Christians. So I think that was an important. Yeah, part. because uh, my own insight to this is, I I think um, I'm able to. Focus on his courage, right? And I think, in a way, that is uh, what uh, we are lacking today. Um, many of the challenges we have today, yeah. we realize that we we need a lot of courage to be able to mm -hmm. put things right, which yeah. due to some political power or some you know, insensitivity to some issues yeah. is not allowing us to do that. Yeah, I think he would have approached it from a different perspective because both Samuel and Edward were very committed to the political structure of their time. They were not people who would look, who saw the faults in it very readily. And when you start moving into the Tractarian era, Tractarians started calling it national apostasy and thinking that um, the church should the church should be the supreme thing and it could be separated from the state. That's a bit different. And Wicks may have been moving in that direction. He may have challenged, uh, he may later in life have come to challenge his, what seems to be an unquestioning acceptance of the political systems of his day. For example, in that sermon I quoted, part of it was uh, admirable, admiring discussion of the Episcopal Church of the United States, which was independent of the political system, more or less, sort of. <laughs> well, you know, it, it wasn't formally connected to it, mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say, in the way that Wicks, Wicks normal, originally thought was less desirable. Thank you. Yeah. Well, this, this has nothing to do with Archdeacon Wiggins, but uh, see, first of all, do you know uh, Archdeacon Coster's first name that you mentioned there? George, I think. There was an Archdeacon, there was a Nathan Coster, a rector of Greenspan, is why I was asking. Mm -hmm. Well, Coster was part of an ecclesiastical family. He was one of several brothers who emigrated to the New Brunswick area. Yeah, and he went back Brunswick. to New Brunswick, but I mean, it's quite possible that it could have been yeah, you know, what a nephew or something, or, you know, some relation to the Coster family. And, and the other thing, the other thing is, is that there's some truth about the Christian gospel in all of this. Uh, I, I think about uh, Leonard Cohen's song, "Everything Has a Crack," but that's how I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. And there's always that. There's always that. Time for for change. That yeah. when the light gets in, yeah. and uh, you hear a lot of uh, things going to court today, mm -hmm. but they're all alleged. They're, yeah. they're not proved. They're not uh, proven until they're proven. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, when Wix was so, feeling... so we had to be careful. I think, and, and we had to put put these things in context. I'm not trying to no. to defend the uh, <laughs> Wix. But he did have some. I, mean, I, I think that his vision, his triple on the south coast, eighteen thirty-three, mm. uh, 
uh, I mean, was a valiant missionary effort oh, that yes. had positive. Uh, and if you read the book, you read his journal, as yeah. I'm sure you have. Yeah. It, you can see that uh, there's there's a driving force behind the behind him. He's concerned about what he's doing. Yeah. And he wants to to uh, because when he arrived in the uh, in my hometown of Balorum, he stayed with the Mrs. Clue. But he was, uh, she was very upset because uh, she didn't have a copy of the book of Common Prayer. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there was a row going on between some drunken man <laughs> that he had to settle. Yeah. <laughs> I, miss, I remember Mrs. Clewitt being mentioned. She's one of the, yes. she'd come from St. Lawrence, Lawrence, I think, where she'd been a teacher with her father and her husband. She'd been a teacher and uh, one of these sort of unofficial pious women. But she, she left her prayer book in. St. Lawrence prayer books are so That's scarce right, yeah. that she didn't feel able to take it with her, but she got another one from Wix, I believe. But you know, the, the, uh, it just as uh, you know, we have to keep it as uh, Bonnie says in, in the context of the times, yes, the, yes, the, the, the events happened. And uh, things were alleged, I'm sure, that like today that weren't that weren't, that weren't uh, accurate. Or if they were, they were all, they were stretched too much, you know. The the details, <laughs> human, there's something about human nature that that does that, yes. even with clergy people. I yes, I think so. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you, Cheryl. Oh, that was wonderful. Does someone want to have a hand their hand up? Uh, Samson had their hand up. Let's see that. Sorry. Yeah, it's down now. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, somebody had their. You know, sure they weren't applauding? Hand raised, but if somebody yeah. online had a question or a comment, now is the time. Yeah. We're a bit <laughs> okay, so thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>